Welcome to the Heart of Innovation, 60 minutes that can save life and limb with new breakthrough ideas and innovation changing the healthcare landscape. Brought to you by patient advocacy group, thewaytomyheart.org, in partnership with Cardiovascular System Incorporated's patient advocacy campaign, Take a Stand Against Amputation. Here are your hosts for the Heart of Innovation, Emmy Award-winning journalist and founder of The Way to My Heart, Kim McNicholas, and interventional cardiologist and founder of the Save My Piggies Health Education Series, Dr. John Phillips. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the show. I'm with Dr. John Phillips, and today we're going to be talking about mental health in patients with chronic physical vascular illnesses. When getting diagnosed with a chronic physical illness and suffering from it, depression and anxiety can set in. So we're going to talk about why this is, as well as innovations around treatments for mental illness throughout today's show. So get your questions ready. Call in if you are listening live and join the discussion. Write this number down, 1-888-367-5329. 1-888-367-5329. Also today, we're joined by the Way to My Heart's nurse practitioner, Kay Smith, as well as a legendary financial and business reporter, Bambi Francisco, who is passionate about healthcare innovation and has a big event coming up where experts will be discussing the evolution of mental health uh, and its treatment. And we have Catherine Walker here. She's the CEO of Revitalist. She is also a nurse. Uh, Revitalist is a chain of mental wellness treatment centers um, across, I think, some of the Midwest and and the East. So we're going to talk to her as well. Big hello to everyone, all of you. But before we dive into the topic of the day, hey, Dr. Phillips, anything top of mind? And we had a, a fantastic week. Um, I heard and I know your dad's on the men, which is which is great. Um, yeah. Treated a lot of patients this, this week. Uh, saw saw a uh, fellow way to my harder uh, uh, sunshine. Um, we but love yeah, I know. So, yes, sunshine. <laughs> she's she's had a tough <laughs> go at it, um, but I think I think we're gonna get her on the mend here soon. Um, you know, Kay, I, I have to empathize with you. I know it's been really rough in the UK with the passing of Queen Elizabeth, the uh, England or Britain's long longest uh, reigning monarch. And so, the, I have two quotes from her um, today that I, that I just like to share. Both of these were, I guess, on her kind of quest for equality. But the first one is. And I, and I quote her, she said, everyone is our neighbor, no matter what race, creed or color. Um, so let that one sink in. And then this was a quote, I think, perhaps around the time of uh, World War II. And she said, when peace comes, remember, it will be for us, the children of today, to make the world of tomorrow a better and happier place. So we send our condolences to those that are mourning the loss of the great Queen Elizabeth. And it's we definitely do. And and nurse practitioner K, I know it's been, you know, rough on on you there. You've been in, in tears. I mean, it, she really has meant a lot. And also to see that it might be something vascular that led to this yes. must be hit home even more for you. I think um, the consensus of opinion, it's not been announced yet, but the consensus of opinion, it was a massive stroke. Wow. But they managed to keep her resting and comfortable until her family got there. So what more could you ask for? Yeah. No, No, actually, actually, I saw a patient yesterday. He's 93. Um, We fixed his an aneurysm for him seven years ago. Less. And uh, he's doing well. And he was telling me that I, his his bride, uh, they've been married 73 years. Oh and I gosh. said to him, I said, Dallas, I probably won't even live to be 73, let alone married that long. So, man, you've won the lottery. So I, I think it's obviously it's a loss. But to have that many years and to do the great things that she's done and did was amazing. So. And, and she's, you know, 12 presidents she's um, she's met 12 American presidents. That's a lot. That's a, yeah. that's amazing. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. wouldn't we all like to live that long? And yeah. you know, I'm curious from Dr. Phillips' point of view that when you get to that age, you know that there's always a huge stroke risk, and there's that balance between, you know, at at, a, at, at that point when someone hits, you know, 85, 86, 87, and even over 90s, is is an aspirin regimen something that is to be considered to help prevent you know, uh, or could it even prevent a, a massive event such as this? Well, so the 
probably one of the biggest causes of stroke for the elderly is from atrial fibrillation. So an abnormal heart rhythm. Oh. Uh, and interestingly enough, we have a way of calculating risk and age plays a role. And, and the folks that are older have a higher risk, yet they're often not given what they need, which is anticoagulation. I'm not speculating at all one way or another about the queen, yeah. but um, we do know that the people at the highest risk for an adverse event, namely a stroke from atrial fibrillation are the elderly and they're not getting often, oftentimes they're not getting the anticoagulation that they need. So we have a lot of safe, safer drugs out there than we did 10 years ago. Um, and so <clears throat> I think we are trying to, to, to treat people appropriately, but I think this kind of dovetails into the whole psychedelic thing that we're going to touch on. But as you get older, you, I think, become aware of your mortality. Um, and from what I've read about some of the psychedelics, LSD, et cetera, they do have the ability in measured doses to kind of dissolve your ego. So I'm really excited to talk to, to Catherine about that um, and, and a bunch of other things and super psyched that Bambi's on the show as well. So I think this is going to be a good show. I think so too. And I can see <laughs> Nurse Walker is already sitting there smiling. She's like, can I jump in yet? Can I, are we going to talk about psychedelics <laughs> Let's get her on. Now? Let's go. Do we have to wait? <laughs> well, I, speaking about the aneurysm or, you know, with the strokes and stuff, right? So I used to do neuroanesthesia as well. So you get to see ischemic strokes and hemorrhagic strokes. So what Dr. Phillips is speaking of is more of an ischemic stroke from the atrial fibrillation. But, you know, people, um, you know, sometimes you, you, you do have, you know, a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, and, you know, 30% of people actually have weaknesses in their cerebral vasculature that no one knows anything about, brain. right? Yeah, yeah, in the brain. So, um, you know, so you can have, you know, spontaneous strokes at any age. But, you know, as, as Dr. Phillips mentioned, um, especially with psychedelics, as we do get older, you know, you do get atrophy of the brain. So your brain does get smaller. Um, but there is um, a lot of really awesome evidence out there that's showing that psychedelics are actually maintaining the um size of the brain as people are aging. Uh, so, you know, it's, you're not getting the atrophy, you're not getting that, you know, the repetition of disease um, with the, with the vasculature in the brain. So yeah, there's a, there's a, I am very excited to be on this show for sure. <laughs> and I have to um, just really quickly, Dr. Phillips, we have Matthew sitting in the emergency room right now and we've been working all morning. She had a revascularization, restoring a blood flow in her um, the arteries in one of her thighs. And a few days later, she has, I'm looking at her feet right now. She just sent me um, possible, um, she has pain and behind her knee and her ankle is really swollen. It almost looks like there's a big baseball in her ankle at this moment. And she has about an hour's wait before they call in the vascular doctor. <laughs> it's a Saturday morning. Um, mm -hmm. Any thoughts, you know, tender to the touch, um, a lot well, of I mean, pain. She says a level 10 pain. You said she she recently had a procedure? Yeah, it was in the thigh. In the thigh. Yeah, I mean, so folks can have post-procedural discomfort, any swelling in, in one of one limb as opposed to both. After a procedure where kind of the infl inflammation's up a little bit, you worry about a blood clot uh, in the veins, not in the arteries. Uh, so hopefully they'll do appropriate testing with an ultrasound and, and get some objective information to to help figure out what's going on. But my first thought would be probably what we call a DVT, deep vein thrombosis. Yep, that's what um, her her general doctor that actually performed the procedure is in a whole other area. He's also thinking as well. So we're wishing um, Beth the best, but I might be checking in with her throughout the show. So I might pop in and out. But uh, coming right up right here on the Heart of Innovation, we're going to get into the topic of the day, which is about mental health. So stay with us and don't go away. Leg health can indicate risk for heart attack, stroke, and amputation. If you have leg pain or cramps while walking, get checked for peripheral artery disease, or PAD. PAD is plaque buildup in mainly the leg arteries. Be sure to ask your physician for an ankle brachial index, also called an ABI test, where they use blood pressure cuffs to analyze the blood pressure in your legs. If they discover you have arterial plaque that's limiting blood flow to your feet, medicine and a regimented walking program are frontline treatment. If PAD is in its advantage, 
advanced stages, your physician may schedule a surgical intervention. Minimally invasive tools are available to remove plaque and restore blood flow, including Cardiovascular System's Diamondback 360 Atherectomy System, which sands away plaque that is a hard calcium. It's important to discuss all options with your physician, and if told you have no options, get a second opinion. Take a stand against amputation. For more information, go to standagainstamputation.com. That's standagainstamputation.com. Welcome back to The Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the show. Today, we are talking about mental health in patients with chronic physical vascular illnesses. You know, when getting diagnosed with a chronic physical illness and suffering from it, depression and anxiety can set in. So we're going to talk about why this is, as well as some of the innovations around the treatment options that might be available. We have Bambi Francisco. She is one of my heroes of all time when it comes to business and financial news. When I first started out my career, she um, in in business back in 1999, I think she was one of the first web-centric reporters with CBS Market Watch. And she has since gone on to do amazing things, including um, now where she runs, she's the CEO of Vader.tv. Um, we just call it Vader, but they do a lot of healthcare reporting and some really impactful conferences um, that have discussions about futuristic things in healthcare. And Bambi, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Kim. And thank you, Dr. Phillips, aka John. <laughs> You're going to make me look bad. Yes. Well said. Welcome, Bambi. <laughs> Um, and so, Bambi, you have a big event coming up. You have a lot of interest, and I've I've seen for a while you've had a, a an, an intense interest in mental health. Why is this, and what is the event you have coming up? Yeah, so let's start with the event. It's October 26, and it is still virtual. So October 26, virtually from 10 a.m. to 3:30 p.m. PST, and we'll take a deep dive into mental and behavioral health and. Yeah, Kim, we've been hosting these events since 2018, um, the future of mental and behavioral health, and, and largely because we have a big problem in society, which is that um, that one in five people have some sort of mental disorder, and COVID clearly has exposed it and exacerbated it. I have a statistic here, a recent yeah. one. There are more children, 5 to 11, that went into the hospital for a mental disorder than COVID. So one out of 100 oh, wow. five to 11 year olds went into the hospital for, for uh, a mental illness. One out of 1000 went in for COVID. So we basically set our sights on attacking this virus. And we had this collateral damage, which is a, a lot more mental illness among the kids. Suicide ideation is up for, for teenagers, largely girls. And so it, it is really important for me. It's, it's, um, it's one of my ways in terms of the events. It's one of the ways that we can gather really smart people to figure out what we're doing wrong and uh, what we can do right. And, and it, you know, so far you've been doing this for a few years. What direction are you taking with this one versus in past events based on how the world has unfolded over the last few years? Anything different, anything new? Yeah, that's a great question because typically... Uh, typically, we focus on the economics, right? Because a lot of times economics drives a change in behavior. You know, the incentive structure changes it, it changes behavior. So we want to understand the, the new business models. But this time, we're going to focus on COVID, the impact of COVID, and what happened, right? Because we the, a lot of things happened in the last two years. And so we want to understand how did that impact and how did the sort of the, um, the way we handled COVID impacted um, our children as well as our workforce. So that's one. The other is we're going to look at new ways of treating COVID or new or old ways like psychedelics. I would say that's possibly an old way. We'll look at um, spirituality. That's an old way as well. But we'll also look at digital therapeutics, which is simply just using software uh, to replace uh, medication, to change your behavior. And we'll also be, I think the other is we're going to take a focus on on children, children and teens, um, because they were really hit hard. Bambi. I thought it was really interesting. And sorry about that, John. Oh, hey, so just real quick, or maybe not quick, but I this thought I can't get out of my head. Do you think that 
the COVID with the isolation kind of, it, it seems like almost a perfect storm isolation with COVID. And then these kids are um, attached to their smartphones and they kind of live in isolation in the phone itself. I mean, do you think the coming, the, the two of those coming together made the mental health, um, this epidemic more profound, more pronounced with COVID or two separate um, issues? No, I think that they certainly collided. Um, you know, I mean, if you have a consistent, sustained isolation, that's clearly not good. If you have sustained, um, you know, engagement with your with your electronics, particularly if you're looking at social media, where you're constantly comparing yourself to others uh, right. and, and needing this, uh, you know, or, you know, it's part of human nature. You want to get validation. So you've got two things happening. You've got you're 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 isolated, you're alone and you're trying to get validation. And all of these things are are, are, are certainly stressful. Right. You don't want to be alone. Who wants to be alone? You can't. No, be and especially when you, you're older, you have a chronic illness as well. We have so many of the friends that we work with through our nonprofit organization, The Way to My Heart, that um, suffer from vascular diseases. And when you have these vascular diseases where you can't get answers, you can't get into your doctor, you don't have your family around to love on you and friends to distract you from your your illness, um, depression, anxiety can just go through the roof that can lead to further chronic physical illness. I know that uh, Nurse Walker, do you want to weigh in on that? Because you're dealing with that every single day with a uh, revitalist. Yeah, no, I, it's a great question. And, you know, um, since I've been in the outpatient community for the last five years, um, I've really been able to to really take an overall picture of what's going on um, mm-hmm. from the perspectives that you guys mentioned, but, you know, one thing that I, and I'm still trying to under or trying to figure out how to verbalize this to people because they don't understand it, but I'll ask people, I'll say, what's your base? And, you know, and, and what people will see, or when I say that a lot of times, I feel like they look at it from a horizontal level, like here's my base, but really the picture that I had the other day was that a compass and almost, you know, our base needs to be the center of a compass and then we can have the balance right all around. So, you know, when John mentions about iPhones and the isolation, I think that's one facet of it. I think COVID is one facet of it that took them away from their normalcy of routine, right? Because routine's a base and that's, and as long as you have your base and your structure, then that's what you know, and then you can't handle stressors around. But if you take that base away and you put someone, you know, if it, instead of the center of the compass, if you put them up on the left side and every things off balance, people lose their frame of reference. And I think that's what COVID did was kind of knock us off track. And then, you know, these children are asking adults, you know, about questions with what, what what's going to happen. And adults are saying, you know, we don't know, we don't understand. Then you could, they can feel the anxiety, they can feel the depression. So these children are supposed to be looking to us for guidance and we're showing them worse mental health than what they currently have. So it's a, you know, it created this whole negative cycle. And I think that's the repercussions, you know, so when you're in a uh, storm or a tornado, you are function when the tornado is there, but it's the repercussions afterwards that you feel that really takes time in order to, you know, put all those pieces back together and heal. And I think that's the period that we're in right now is it's going to take a second because our entire environment's different. So yeah, yes. I, everything that you all say, you know, there's, there's so much structure and substance there that's not been created yet. I'd love to add on to that because when you lose structure, that means you sort of lose trust, right? You trust in the structure, you trust in your parents, you trust in those in charge. And I think there was a loss loss of trust because we kind of zigged and zagged in terms of the policies with regards to whether we should lock down, whether we should go back to school, whether we should uh, wear masks, not masks, vaccine, not vaccinate, isolate. And, and it was very confusing. And that means you're losing trust in the way things work. And when you lose trust, you're losing oxytocin and you really need that oxytocin. That is the hormone that, that's typically called the, the love hormone. Yeah. That's what that's what soothes you. And and when you don't have that, then, you know, there's all sorts of things. Your cortisol level, cortisol levels rise and then we can go, get into what's happening in your brain when that's happening. But I think that's, you know, that is Catherine, you you hit the nail on the head, which is we lost our structure. Yeah. And coming up right here on the Heart of Innovation, we'll have some possible new treatment options or as Dr. Phillips mentioned, not so 
new. We'll tell you what those are coming up next, so stay with us. Three years ago, my symptoms started with leg pain and leg cramps while walking. Me too, with a tightness in my calves. Well, do you know, my doctor thought that my leg cramps were a side effect of the statin he prescribed me. Well, my doctor just brushed them off as another symptom of old age. Mine thought the pain was radiating from my spine. My doctor blamed my neuropathy on diabetes until I got a wound on my foot that just wouldn't heal. Yeah, it turns out we all have peripheral artery disease, also known as PAD. It's plaque buildup mainly in the leg arteries causing poor circulation. For me, the diagnosis came too late and I lost my leg, but that does not have to happen to you. No, it does not because there are treatment options available if you're diagnosed early enough. PAD, peripheral artery disease. If you've been experiencing leg pain, leg cramps, or neuropathy when walking, and your doctor isn't hearing you, we are. We are the way to my heart, the largest support network for peripheral artery disease patients. And we want to help you get back on your feet again. Visit our website at thewaytomyheart.org or call our Legsaver hotline 415-320-7138. Your life and limb could depend on it. Welcome back to the Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. A fascinating show today, talking about mental health um, as it relates as well to COVID and chronic illness as well, whether you're young or whether you're old or whether you're in between. We do have a question coming in from Marie, who's hopped on here. How do you prevent getting into a dark place after 53 surgeries. She finds herself there most of the time. We have both nurse Catherine Walker, who is here with Revitalist, a chain of mental wellness um, treatment centers. And we have Bambi Francisco, who is an amazing journalist in healthcare and CEO of Vader, V-A-T-O-R. And um, why don't we start with you, Nurse Walker, and do you want to address Marie's question? Sure. Yeah. So the brain likes um, redundant patterns. Uh, so a lot of times I'll tell people, you know, everyone believes in um, muscle memory, uh, mm-hmm. and but no one believes in behavioral memory, right? So your muscles actually don't have memory. It's your brain. So when you've been through 53 surgeries, um, the reason you do go to a dark place is because you, you're remembering all your brain's remembering all those different places, um, you know, as you've kind of traveled through this journey, per se. Um, so, you know, one thing that to look at is control versus feeling out of control is you're putting a lot of control and your trust um, on these surgeries to try to feel better. And so you've already been through 53 it, it's a consistent pattern of negativity that your brain's really gotten stuck on and, and rightfully so it makes complete sense. So that's actually something called your default mode network in your brain. Um, so there's, there's positive and there's negative in your brain. So a place to look at, try to look at is to try to analyze, um, you know, the darkness as to why. And if you look at your default mode network, it, it's got a lot of good data and statistics out there that shows exactly why your brain's basically protecting itself. Um, So it's going to tell you, well, surgery 54, you might need surgery 55. And that's, it's not called, it's called catastrophic thinking, but not really. Um, But you're just trying, your brain's trying to predict the pattern as to what you've already been through. So if you can continue to maybe work on, you know, with um, some meditation processes or different aspects that you do have more control over, instead of putting all your control on the surgeries, that might help balance your mental health. Um, but understandably so you've, um, you know, it's, it's, you've been through difficult times. So it's trying to work on your mental wellness, um, to really kind of prep yourself, uh, for the journey that, that lies ahead. And hopefully you won't have to have more than 53 surgeries. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. And and that's nurse practitioner Kay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what your feelings are on it, Kathy, um, but, or Catherine, but basically, I'm allergic to painkillers, which I know in itself is a very unusual allergy. Um, And it's everything from paracetamol right up to opioids. 
Um, so I fell into the dark space because I was in a lot of pain and chronic pain in itself is an illness and it becomes separate from your other comorbidities. You suffer from chronic pain. And in America, it's more of an issue because you have different rules and regulations. And one thing that has just become licensed with the FDA for the use in chronic pain and is about to be licensed on mental health strategies is VR, which I'm sure you're aware of. Um, this is a VR headset and I use the Quest 2 at the moment and for mindfulness and for um, resting my brain and for switching off from fear and anxiety and bringing me out of that dark space, I use certain programs on my VR. So I use Nature Treks. That's my favorite. Nature Treks is the whole area that you're in turns into a pond, a lily pond, and it has shooting stars going above and it has butterflies flying around. And you literally have all these doors in front of you and every single door is an adventure. So I can choose to open a door and go scuba diving. I can choose to open another door and go on safari. I can choose to open another door and shoot off into space and see how small we are in the whole realm of the galaxies. And then I can go on a mountain trek and listen to David Attenborough talking me down for about 10 minutes on his mindfulness program. Um, VR is works in 90 odd percent of patients now, especially in chronic pain, but more so in mental health. It's also extremely useful for stroke patients for getting them to rehabilitate. Um, it also teaches people with macular degeneration how to use the vision, using the peripheral vision rather than the macular. So it treats macular degeneration as well. And wow, it's actually, it does a lot of things. It does. And I mean, literally, it's going to be licensed more and more and more. And I would advocate anyone with problems, go and get one of these. And, you know, Bambi, you have a lot of you mentioned at the beginning of the show about faith based technologies and and, and such that you're going to be discussing at your upcoming conference. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's. There's a lot of studies that show that people who are religious live longer, right? Live five years yeah. longer. And you can just look, open the Bible, and it could tell you, be anxious for nothing but through prayer and supplication. Let all your, your worries be known to the Lord. And so I would say one thing is be anxious for nothing. Um, you know, do what you can. You know, obviously, you've had 50, over 50 surgeries, so you have to do your homework to understand that you're doing the right things. Uh, but then you have to trust in the decisions you make and then leave it there, right? Because what Kay is talking about with uh, VR is what VR is trying to do is trying to take you away from thinking about yourself and obsessing about yourself. And while what you're doing in your um, in your brain, and, and John mentioned this, is that the psychedelics do, does this to your brain. It's sort of lowers your ego it is doing that because it is it's basically deactivating sort of the me center part of your brain and so meditation can do that as well and so by doing vr thinking outside of yourself praying meditating um you deactivate that part of the brain and the meditation also actually thickens the hippocampus um this you know that's the area of the learn the learning part of your brain and so you're not having these memory lapses you're really you know learning more um meditation also helps you with your prefrontal cortex which is the part of the brain that helps you gather knowledge and organize information so there you can make wise decisions and not be reactionary um it also impacts your amygdala that's the area where you sort of process fear so you're not too fearful constant fear fearfulness means you're going to be more stressed more stressed out um it also helps with you being not so fearless, right? So it sort of evens that out. So meditation is really good in sort of reconnecting the parts of the brain that need to be connected. And it all starts with you thinking outside of yourself and not obsessing and not trusting in the work you've done to get you to the place where you are making the right decision. So you need to de-stress so you can be calm. That's what meditation does, right? It, it brings you to this place of calm. But I'd add that prayer does that one thing that meditation doesn't do. And I think it, that sort of adds that element of trust, 
which, and, and again, it brings out oxytocin, which, you know, in meditation, you're sort of what you're trusting in yourself, but you know, that's, that's a lot, that's a big burden that you're putting on yourself and VR, you're sort of just taking your mind away from your your situation, which is good, right? That can be helpful. My mom was really stressed out. I took her to a Hawaiian luau. She's like, that was the best thing I needed, right? It was perfect, you know, and it made her super happy, uh, took away her stress. And so I'm not dismissing VR, it's great. Um, but what is happening is what you need to do is get to that point of calm. We'll come up next right here on the Heart of Innovation. We are going to talk about one more very interesting solution that everyone has been just slightly touching on in psychedelics. We also have our regular Save My Piggies. We have a, um, a patient that is eager to tell her story about how one of our network doctors has saved her legs. So stay with us right here on 860 AM, The Answer. Welcome back to The Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist, Kim McNicholas, and interventional cardiologist, Dr. John Phillips. Welcome back, everyone. It's time for our Save My Piggy segment. This is the segment that is devoted to patients and patient education and awareness as it pertains to peripheral arterial disease. I'm really happy to have Denise as our guest. Denise, you have peripheral arterial disease, and I believe your father actually had it as well. Right. And that got you thinking about, well, maybe maybe I have something going on, too, and maybe I should get checked out. Is that right? Kind of. I've always known since I was I can remember him having amputations, infections, pacing all night long, agony. But I always knew it was in could be in the future. I was hoping it was my brother, but I got it. So so what were your symptoms? Your brother. (laughs) That's nice. What'd your brother think of that? (laughs) Exactly. I don't know. (laughs) What what kind of what kind of symptoms did you have that that led to the evaluation initially and ultimately sounds like some interventions or procedures? It was started about 10 years ago. There's a whole bunch of different diagnoses until um, I had a biopsy on my toenail that wouldn't heal at the beginning of this year. And that's where it's, I went to a few different doctors. They weren't willing or able to do anything. And then I found Kim. Yeah, so- and the way to my heart. And we were able to get her to uh, Dr. Kirk Minkus in Phoenix. Fantastic. So then they, they obviously did some evaluation and you had some blockages or blockage in both legs or one leg? Both legs. Um, both. He did the right leg, the left leg on May 31st and June 29th. He did the right leg and then had to go back to the left leg Wednesday. Oh, yeah. So past, you just had another procedure. Wednesday. Yeah. And so how did it what was life like? You one of the things that struck me about you is you're married and yes. you have a beautiful daughter. And um, you said that it was, you, you actually didn't realize at first that it was affecting your love life. I had no idea. I mean, I, it was such a gradual thing. And I thought it was my own aging that was slowing everything down. Right, and you then get more, leg, leg cramps. Yeah, it was cramps, um, burning, get out of breath, heart palpitations, all kinds of stuff. And then all of a sudden, after my right leg was done and I was healed up, it just, everything was done. It was fixed. I bet your You're husband's blushing your right now. Again. <laughs> <What'd> you- <laughs> I said, I bet your husband's blushing right now. <laughs> no, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> so what advice would you have for other people that were in your situation? Don't quit. I did. I did quit. And that's when I found you and I even quit after I saw Dr. Minkus. I just completely given it up. I just the only reason I did it was to appease my husband. And now everything is turned around everything. So we we spent the the first several segments of the show talking about mental health. Do Do you think you were depressed? Extremely. I was not to the point of suicide, but I was to the point of I'm not taking these stupid meds because they're keeping me alive. But you just were frustrated because you weren't getting any better. Right. Nobody could find it. Even trying to get cholesterol medication. My doctor was like, you're only 45. 
there's no rush. You don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Everybody kept pushing me off because of my age. <clears throat> but obviously you're in a better place now. Oh, much. <laughs> so aside from not quitting, being compliant with your medications, you exercise regularly. We always talk about walking, right? Yes. So you stay active. That, that was what it was. I, I continued to exercise through heart attack, through everything that I've had. Nothing stopped me. But it, I was telling Kim, I made a conscious decision to use exercise, keep my body busy instead of my brain. And so when this took my body away, I was done. Well, yeah, I'm glad you, we're glad you got your body back. That's for sure. Thank you so much for being on our Save My Piggy segment. We appreciate it. Thanks. So, Kim, we should get back to psychedelics, right? I, I need to know well, how much I should take and, and how long my trip should be, right? <laughs> Definitely. Um, Nurse Catherine Walker is here with us and she runs Revitalist. Um, it's a chain of uh, mental health, mental wellness um, and treatment centers um, across to Kentucky, Tennessee and a few other states. So can we in short talk about psychedelics? I mean, it has this stereotype to them that they're this dangerous drug per se. Can you uh, give us the reality of it? Sure. Yeah. So psychedelics, they're going to change the, the whole landscape of healthcare. Um, they're, they're so comprehensive. They're going to be a, a class of medications. There's, there's going to be several different classes of medications that actually come from psychedelics. It's showing improvement in your neurologic health. It's actually showing improvement in your cardiac health, as well as your pulmonary health, right, with your lungs. Um, so these are all you know facets that people just don't understand. And we're still learning all these different pieces. So psychedelics back in the 70s, they were very unregulated. And in society, right, we overuse or everything. Uh, so we they abused them. They took them away. They didn't think that they had any type of medical benefit. So therefore, they made them scheduled one drugs. And you know, since 1985, actually, there has been a psychedelic center that's been looking, uh, working with the FDA, looking at psychedelics. And uh, Rick Doblin is actually someone who's really been an advocate for those. So that happened in 1985. Uh, with the clinics that we have right now, we actually give the drug ketamine. It's an FDA approved drug since 1970, and it's being used in similarities to the psychedelic piece and similar mechanism of action and such. Yale University actually discovered that ketamine caused a very similar reaction as psychedelics. And that was actually in the late 1990s. So the unfortunate part is it's 2022 and we still don't know. Right. And as Dr. Phillips knows, this is, this is how quickly medicine moves, um, which is, you know, very slow paced and sometimes even backwards. So with psychedelics, we're seeing that. The brain, it's, it's really more on the structure of the brain. And it's, a, you know, it's an anatomical piece. It's a physiologic piece. It's a uh, psychological piece. It has to do with everything, your mental health, your mental wellness, your emotional capacities, your spiritual pieces. And really what all these puzzles or pieces of the puzzle do is really make our brain comprehensive. So psychedelics, we're going to see much more of them. Ketamine right now is in real time. Uh, actually, Revitalist has a contract with the VA to where the VA covers the veterans that come to us uh, 100% for their services. And um, But that's just with the ketamine piece. So right now in the States, in the U.S., all psychedelics are still illegal. Um, they're still scheduled one drugs. So some of those substances that we hear about, they, you know, they're called um, psilocybin. That's your mushrooms. We've got MDMA, uh, LSD. You have ibogaine, you have ayahuasca, you have 5-MeO, um, you have all these, there's really about seven um, pretty significant uh, categories of psychedelics. So what people are doing right now is they're actually going outside of the country to get access to these um, substances. And, you know, that's something that we're actually working with a company to establish an international center of excellence to give them access to psilocybin. But the issue is, We've got to open our eyes up a little bit more because these are the most evidence-based mental health drugs we've ever seen. And that's the exciting part. The exciting part is when you do have to look at the benefits as well as the risks. And when you look at the risks of these, these medications, they are significantly less than any of the antipsychotics, any of your SSRIs, any of your antidepressants. There's no comparison. Is it so true that you at, can't, um, these aren't, they're not addictive and you 
technically really can't overdose on them. Is that correct? Or am I wrong? You, right. So, yeah. So when you overdose on other medications in the, in the mental health or in, in medicine, you know, it decreases your respirations, decreases your cardiac function and psychedelics don't, um, they really don't, you know, it, it may, it may mess with your, your brain just to, just a skosh, but, um, but right. You don't, um, overdose on those. And really it's, um, it's going to be a safety piece. It's going to be great. Um, that's going to allow us to really move forward. Well, I think we can uh, continue this conversation in our last segment. So please stay tuned. Leg health can indicate risk for heart attack, stroke, and amputation. If you have leg pain or cramps while walking, get checked for peripheral artery disease, or PAD. PAD is plaque buildup in mainly the leg arteries. Be sure to ask your physician for an ankle brachial index, also called an ABI test, where they use blood pressure cuffs to analyze the blood pressure in your legs. If they discover you have arterial plaque that's limiting blood flow to your feet, medicine and a regimented walking program are frontline treatment. If PAD is in its advanced advanced stages, your physician may schedule a surgical intervention. Minimally invasive tools are available to remove plaque and restore blood flow, including cardiovascular system's Diamondback 360 atherectomy system, which sands away plaque that is a hard calcium. It's important to discuss all options with your physician, and if told you have no options, get a second opinion. Take a stand against amputation. For more information, go to standagainstamputation.com. That's standagainstamputation.com. Welcome back to The Heart of Innovation. For more on today's topic, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. Once again, here's Emmy Award-winning journalist, Kim McNicholas, and interventional cardiologist, Dr. John Phillips. We're continuing our conversation about mental health and specifically the use of psychedelics. So, Kathy, tell us a little bit about how one would get access to a psychedelic. I mean, you, you don't want it to be like in the seventies or sixties where you're just buying it off the streets and it's counterculture, right? I mean, these are very structured methods of distributing these agents, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so to get access to psychedelics outside of ketamine uh, in the United States, you actually have to be part of a research study. So Johns Hopkins um, Psychedelic Center, they, uh, they have studies going on all the time. So we would really encourage people to reach out to Johns Hopkins, uh, see what studies they do have available. I know there is a one coming out with uh, psilocybin and smoking cessation that they're having a really lo a lot of good results with. Yeah. So that's a big piece um, that we, you know, we really need to push our politicians uh, to really help to bring this mainstream because the last thing we want is to go out on the streets and try to get, get our own access because you don't know. Right. So they're not, they're working on pharma grade. We've got to get pharma grade psychedelics um, accessible to people. So they're clean, same dose, same safety index, and then consistent healing, right? So that's something that we really want to do. And then the other piece that we want to do, which is what we focus on a lot with Revitalist is in the space, when you take these, these substances, we actually have a therapist or a coach that sits with you during so you're able to see a lot of the substance that's really causing your mental health to keep cycling. And if you're able to see what's causing those triggers or the cycle, then you become empowered and you are able to actually stop the, the, the negative cycling of your mental illness or mental health. So we have a lot of individuals who've been able to get off their medications, get off their narcotics, get off all their antidepressants, and they're in complete remission of their symptoms uh, for, for years. And this is something that's exciting too with addiction. So with addiction, we're seeing that addiction is, it's called a negative default mode. And it's, it's a pattern that the brain thinks it's what is the correct thing to do. And psychedelics will actually put the brain back in a neutral space. The brain reanalyzes it and they are having such wonderful results uh, that we've never even seen with addiction. And, it, and addiction is just an addiction, right? It doesn't matter the substance. It's the primary root cause in the brain. So that's what psychedelics are seeing. So do they have the potential to be addicting? Yes, like anything else. Because people can get addicted to the psychological aspects. So say if I'm in an uh, abusive relationship and I'm able to get out of the abusive relationship just for a second, 
with that piece and I'm not using therapy to actually work on those issues, then that's a crutch that I'm creating. But unlike opioids, so when you take an opioid, you actually lose, your body loses its natural opioid receptors function, right? That's why people who are on opioids, they actually have more pain. So, you know, it's the same thing um, to where you just have to be aware of it, um, that, you know, are you using this to heal? Are you using it the right, the right way? And if you are, then you heal and you go back to remission of your symptoms. So this is going to be groundbreaking. It's going to be very exciting for the whole world. It is. And I just want to make sure just in short, really quick, I want to remind everyone of in, in stress what you had said, Nurse Walker, in, in terms of this is not something that you you should go out to the back market and just fly out of the country for. I mean, this is needs to be seriously regulated and you have to be careful in terms of the direction that you go with it and even partaking in it. Thank you so much, Nurse Walker, for being here. Bambi, a uh, quick 30 seconds, your big event coming up that'll include a discussion about psychedelics um, likely as well. Can you give us the 30 second uh, pitch on it? On the event, okay, October 26, 11, uh, I'm sorry, 10 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Uh, PST. Um, you can go to vader.tv or events.vader.tv to find the event. It's called The Future of Mental and Behavioral Health. We'll talk about uh, the impact of COVID policies on our mental health. We'll talk about mental health with uh, children and teens and young young adults. We'll talk about, um, and we'll talk about psychedelics and spirituality and different treatments for mental health. Thank you so much. Bambi Francisco with Vader.TV, Catherine Walker with Revitalist, Nurse Practitioner Kay Smith with The Way to My Heart, and of course, Dr. John Phillips. If you want more information, go to theheartofinnovation.org. See you next week, everyone. You've been listening to The Heart of Innovation with Emmy Award-winning journalist Kim McNicholas and interventional cardiologist Dr. John Phillips. Our mission is to help patients live a better quality of life through comprehensive education, real-time support, and high-touch advocacy in partnership with thewaytomyheart.org and take a stand against amputation. Our purpose is to reduce the 1.5 million heart attacks and strokes and nearly 200,000 amputations annually. For more information regarding topics you've heard discussed on today's program, go to theheartofinnovation.org. That's theheartofinnovation.org. The Heart of Innovation is for educational and informational purposes only, and advice and views shared are not a substitute for medical advice from your own supervising physician. Do not act on any information provided in this show without the explicit consent from your own healthcare team. If you think you are having a medical emergency, call your local emergency number or go to the nearest hospital or emergency room.